Okay, everyone, we're going to get started. And I need to share with you how absolutely thrilled and excited I am to introduce this keynote speaker to us. Um, for those of you that have watched me over the past year, um, we have literally vetted out who the keynote speaker is going to be. This was not an easy process. Um, so our invitation to you has come with a lot of thought behind it. really want to know you to know that. Um, it started in February, and we truly wanted an individual that was going to match our directions of the California Alarm Association as we move forward in 2016 and beyond with the transformational change in leadership that we are looking at. I am so pleased to be able to introduce Dave Logan today. Let me share a little bit about his background. Dave has been a consultant and a professor in the change management business for over 20 years. He's worked with most of the Fortune 500 companies, and I wrote down just a couple names, Coca-Cola, Intel, McDonald's, Disney, and that's just a few, very few of all the ones that he's worked with. He is a New York, best, New York Times best-selling author for two books, um, an incredible focused individual on ensuring industries are being able to make the leap. Sometimes the toughest leaps that we have to make, he's worked it across various industries, not just in the security industry. So I know he's going to have a lot to share with us today. And he also shared with me that he had done a lot of work with Canadian groups as well, too. So I personally thank you for doing that, having come from Alberta, Canada. Um, it is my pleasure, it is my delight to invite David Logan to the stage. Please give him a warm welcome, and we look forward to your presentation and the interactive workshop. Great. Thank you. All right, everyone, thank you. Well, I just want to echo what you just heard. Often when associations call and they want something, what they really normally say is, we've got this time slot, and could you just kind of come and do your thing? And I say, what do you want? And they say, you know, your thing. And I, by the way, usually say no to those, because that just doesn't benefit anybody. But this was a very different experience. It was a very different experience from my end from the very beginning, and I'm saying this because it's going to set up what we do here. I heard a lot about transformation, a lot about the need for change, and that personally resonates with me, and let me tell you why. Since I study organizational change, I look to organizations that either are changing because they have no choice or have the foresight to change quickly, perhaps in advance of something that is going to be done to them. Now, I mentioned organizations. The same is true of industry. So just to give you a sense, when I wrote my dissertation, I did it in aerospace, in defense. Bill Clinton was president. Hundreds of millions of dollars were being extracted, that was the word they like to use in the defense industry, extracted from these big defense contractors, and that money was never coming back. It was a change or die situation. In about 2000, I was spending a lot of time up here in the Bay Area looking at the dot coms. Stuff happens, right? In, let's see, 2000, probably 2002, a lot of my students at USC in the executive MBA program were executives in the music industry. We know what happened in music. A lot of my students now, since I live in Los Angeles, are executives with the big studios. File sharing is continuing to change things. I've done work in commercial real estate and finance in 2007 and 2008. Now, I might look back at those and say, first of all, wow, we really don't want Dave around because when he goes, right, something bad happens. But please understand, I went there because change was happening and in all of those examples, and I've given you intentionally negative examples, they're also positive examples, there are lots of people, lots of organizations that saw what was happening, got ahead of the curve, and made some really extraordinary things happen. That's what we're here to look at. As you heard in the intro, this is not going to be a keynote. It, I mean, it's billed as a keynote because that's kind of what you put here before lunch. It's a keynote when you pull up the template in Microsoft Word for, so it's called a keynote. But we're actually going to make use of the fact that we're sitting at round tables, and I'm going to ask you some really important questions about where your industry is going, and we're going to have a big group conversation about this. And we're not just going to practice, or sorry, we're not just going to talk about leadership and transformation, we're going to do it in the room. We could think about it from an organizational level, you could think about it from an industry level, it works at both levels. Uh, forgive just a 
kind of self um, statement here, but one of the things that I'm really proud of is I wrote a business book, and it was the only business book that Desmond Tutu, the Nobel laureate uh, Peace Prize winner in South Africa ever endorsed. And that's actually the process that I'm gonna take you through today. It is, a, again, it's a transformative process. I have to warn you in advance, especially near the beginning, it might get a little bit pessimistic. That is the nature of the beast. If we don't see exactly what's happening, we can't make an effective change to deal with it. So please just know that that's coming. But let's start actually in a very happy place. I'm gonna introduce a concept here which will get clear as we, uh, as we go through this. And the concept is called default future. And uh, there we go, default future. And I've got some objectives here, but let's just kind of jump, jump to the chase. I want you to imagine that you are on vacation. Now we're in San Francisco, which is in one of the really beautiful places. This is a much easier thing to talk about if you're, I don't know, in Toronto in the snow or something and people are just miserable, but we're in San Francisco. So I had to try to find a picture for you that is even prettier than San Francisco, and I found one from French Polynesia. So I want you to imagine that you are on vacation here, and we're just gonna talk about sensory input. In this example, what is filling your screen of vision, in other words, what you're seeing is this, not on a, spread, or not on a PowerPoint screen in a hotel, in a ballroom, but you're actually here. I want you to imagine that the chair that you're sitting in is a way more comfortable chair and it's the chair that you'd be sitting on if you were here. So we're just talking about what is coming into your brain as sensory input. So eyes, you see this. It's warm, if you've not been to French Polynesia, it can get actually very warm. You can see that it rains a lot. And these storms come in, dump a whole bunch of rain, and five minutes later the storms are gone. So I want you to imagine that one of those storms has come in and dumped a bunch of rain and looks like its work is done. And maybe in one of your hands you have a drink Mine probably would have some alcohol in it. Mine probably would have a little umbrella. So I want you to imagine if that's kind of what you do. I like to read cool Tom Clancy style books when I'm here in a place like this. So I'm probably gonna have that in my other hand. So just, if you're with me in this scenario. Now I'm gonna ask you a couple questions and I just love to have one or two people or more shout out an answer. I'll repeat it so we can all hear it. The first question is gonna be a hard one to answer and a lot of you are gonna jump right to the second question. But I'm gonna start with the first question. What do you expect to happen? You're on vacation, you got your drink, you got your book, this is what you're seeing when you're not reading your book. It's warm, breeze, sound of the ocean. What is it you expect to happen? Nap, Nap okay, you are jumping right to the second question. So let me tell you what the second question is. <laughs> what do you do? And the answer is, I take a nap, I, having been to this part of the world, service can be a little slow. When I see one of the people, let's line up the drinks, right? It's called supply chain. So let's order, right, just so I'm ready. But remember, the so two questions, you've answered number two, which is what do you do? But I'm gonna go back to the hard one to answer because it is at the heart of what we're here to talk about today. And that is, what is it you expect to happen? Nothing. Okay, now I don't think you mean the world is gonna end, oblivion, apocalypse, nothing like that. It's just kind of, nothing's gonna change, right? At some point, the sun will go down. So you might be thinking, well, I, I kind of don't get the point here. Well, just notice that there's some expectation that you have. It's probably not an expectation that you think about. It's probably not an expectation you talk about. You're probably not gonna turn to your significant other and say, you know, I expect nothing to change. Your significant other would probably pull your drinks away if you said, like, just a peculiar thing to say. And yet, when it comes to your actions, they're very consistent. So now let me give you a second example. Precisely the same sensory input, so I'm gonna leave this up on the screen. And as you've got your drink in your hand, something very unusual has happened. You might have noticed in parts of the world that are like this, after the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami, and tsunamis can happen all around the world if we know, they installed a tsunami warning system. They test them on Thursdays. It's not Thursday and it has just gone off. And if you've not heard of tsunami warnings, they are frightening by design. That's what they're supposed to be. You're in the alarm and security business, you know that. And so it makes a horrible sound and then it goes up in both volume and uh, you probably know the term, it resonates in your, in your bones. That way if someone is deaf or on their way to becoming deaf, they can still feel it. So it goes up, it squeals, then it goes down and there's a moment of silence. In the second scenario, we are in that moment of silence. 
And well, you're trying to figure out what's going on. Did someone stumble over it? Is this a false test? What's going on? You hear words through a bullhorn. This is French Polynesia, so they're likely to be in French first, then translated, tsunami warning, this is not a drill, get to higher ground. Now, I'm gonna ask you two questions, same two questions. Number one, what do you expect? Okay, so I heard three things. I heard a lot of water, I heard tsunami, and I heard chaos. They're all really good answers. In terms of neuroscience, which is one of the things you have to study if you're looking at human change, what actually comes up from your sort of gut as, a, as an expectation is panic and chaos. I don't know what's going to happen. I only know that it's really, really bad. That's the sense. If you've ever been in, I've lived in California my whole life, been in the epicenter of two major earthquakes, there's a point on the Richter scale where your brain does not tell you, I think this is an earthquake approximately 6.2 on the Richter scale. Your brain just says, this is effed up. I mean, that's sort of the sense, and forgive me for referring to a word but not mentioning it. But I'm trying to be true to the research here. And so in this example, that's kind of what hits you as an expectation. So question number two, last question in this scenario with the pretty picture, what do you do? Run. Notice you don't need to think about it. I was doing this at NASA. As one guy said, I, I wouldn't run. I, I'd be there with my wireless device. I'd never go anywhere without good Wi-Fi coverage. So I'd probably Google the last eight or nine tsunami warnings. And as you know, he continues in the story of this big NASA session, probably a lot of tsunamis are measured in half an inch, an inch. I'd probably look to see where I was, establish a 95% confidence interval away from the water. His friend said, you would not. You'd run out, you'd jump out of your chair. You'd scream and you'd go running up the hill with your iPad up in the air and probably bonk you on the head. And that his friend was actually right because the amygdala takes over in part of the brain that's very primitive. So what is the point that I'm making here? When it comes to change, clearly we have to do something different. That's obvious, that's definitional. So I'm, why are we talking about it? Because change requires that you look to see probably where you're headed. And so what determines how people behave the way they do. It's th this idea of a default future. So what is a default future? I have a really good friend who's a psychiatrist at Washington University in St. Louis. If you know anything about Masters and Johnson, the sex researchers, th she's in the same part of Washington University that they did their research. That story, the fact that Masters and Johnson were there has no relevance, but it let me mention it, so it's interesting. And so she works mostly with couples, but not like Masters and Johnson did. She's a psychiatrist, and so she gets into relational issues. So people come in her office, and they say, we're here to work on our marriage. And she says, great, let's start. She mentions billing and all this stuff. And after that, she says, okay, ready to get down to it? What is the default future of the process of counseling? And they turn to each other and say, the what? We don't know what that means. Okay, let me explain it. Default future means, so I'm gonna ask you, so please listen carefully. Default future answers the question, what is likely to happen if nothing unexpected comes along? And she said, and they look to each other and say, well, we don't know, that's why we're here. Right, I know. So how do you answer the question? You look to your gut and you verbalize what you see. This gut level, often undiscussed expectation. And so as my friend is telling me, she's a medical doctor, often what happens, she works mostly with heterosexual married couples, the woman will speak first and say, we are getting a divorce. And they're both stunned by hearing that. The person who heard it is stunned. The person who said it is equally stunned because these default futures drive our behavior. We almost never talk about them. We just find ourselves behaving in a certain way. And so then she says, well, okay. Uh, and often they'll say, well, we don't wanna do that. Well, wait, stop, stop. If we really wanna use good leadership here, ironic that a psychiatrist is using good leadership, then we have to follow that a little bit more. So, whoever said we're gonna get divorced, look here and here's the question, what actions would you find yourself taking if that is your default future? Well, simple, exactly what we've been doing now. Fight, but not about the real stuff. Fight about the dishes. Fight about who's gonna take out the trash. And then what? Come here and disclose some stuff, but not you know, the real stuff. After all, why ruin your afternoon? Okay, well then what happens if you take actions that are like that? Well, we'd probably reconcile for a while, probably break up again, finally, eventually break up for good. We'd have to tell the the children, we'd have to tell the neighbors, and they'll say, have you tried therapy? Not only have we tried therapy, we went to a professor, a medical doctor on faculty at Washington University. Oh, well then it was you know, meant to be. And now they're not very happy. 
And then she says, but remember, we've just started. So now we can use leadership. So I'm a few minutes into a topic on leadership. I haven't mentioned what leadership is from this point of view. So let me define leadership. Leadership is making something happen that wasn't going to happen anyway. So if you like your default future, don't change it. Don't mess with it. You're going to find yourself behaving in that way. You don't have to be reminded. You don't need to write yourself a note. You don't need to have your iPhone buzz. You will take actions that are consistent with that. It is automatic. We are all on autopilot. That's how it works. So let me just give you one other example that we're going to drop into organizations. I asked my graduating executive MBA students were top rated in leadership, for number one. And I asked them at the very end, I've saved the best for last. You have to do two questions, otherwise you don't get out of the program. Number one, I want to know what the default future of your career is. So how do you answer it? You look here and you give words. It gets turned into me. TAs don't read it. I'm the only one who does. Question number two, is that what you want? I'm going to tell you about one that I got in really recently. The person said, I'm only changing the name of the company for confidentiality. He said, I'm currently vice president at Boeing. That's the only thing I've changed. And so my default future, what's likely to happen, is I'm about to get promoted. In fact, the reason I'm getting my MBA, I'll do respect to you and the faculty and blah, blah, blah. I just need the letters. So as soon as I get the letters, I'm promoted. Senior vice president, huge company, Boeing. And at that point, I'm going to be in the running for EVP. I already know I'm in the succession plan. And the truth is, although I'm quite young, there's a conversation that maybe I could be one of the people to potentially run this organization. So I look here. That's my default future. Pretty awesome. Potentially being the next C or maybe not the next, but the next, after the next, CEO of this big company. Question number two that I ask all my students is, is that what you want? Here's what the person wrote. Hell no. <laughs> I hate everything about my job. I go to meetings, people want my budget. I go golfing with people, they want jobs. I talk to my fellow classmates, they want jobs. And when I'm in a meeting, they want you know, these open positions that I have, FTEs, full-time equivalents. I mean, everything has become political. Furthermore, my spouse is addicted to spending money. My children all go to private school. They're little, and I've got a whole bunch of them, so they're going to be in school for a long time. I'm in prison help, and a bunch of exclamation marks. So I ended up having coffee with a student, and I said, what are you doing? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you wrote that this is really awful and horrible. He said, it is. And I said, what actions are you taking? He said, oh, well, I've actually got good news. I've already been promoted to senior vice president. Remember, you find yourself taking actions. Now, that's not a bad default future. Uh, interestingly, he is no longer at Boeing because I had the conversation with him and he found a way to do what leadership says, which is making something happen that wasn't going to happen anyway. The reason I started with my psychiatrist friend is she found by dropping in that question at the start of therapy, if couples were committed to staying together, often they did just by having the conversation. What I do at USC, among other things, is to train a lot of entrepreneurs. I've done it for years. And training, and I know some of you are entrepreneurial, some of you are bigger company and so on. But the thing about entrepreneurs is they've got to live this. And big companies have got to act like they're entrepreneurial. That's the whole move in business. But here's the problem. Our default futures drive our behavior. So now I'm going to tell you about a couple of organizational examples, then we're going to drop into the really working session here. Okay, I've got a slide here that just says what default future is. It answers the question, what's likely to happen if nothing unexpected comes along? If I'm reading the expressions on your face right, some of you are thinking about the default future of your career. You're welcome. That's not what we're here to talk about. But really, you're welcome. I hope everybody does that on a regular basis. Every group, every family, every industry, every company, every department, every business unit, every team has a default future. It's not always the same. It could vary from person to person. But that is what determines people's actions. If we want to make something happen that wasn't going to happen anyway, we need something to push against, which is why the default future conversation is so interesting. So I'm just going to show you a great company, and I have permission to say what the company is. They're in the news right now for some not great reasons, but overall they're a very good company. It's called Zappos. Pretty well known. It's now part of Amazon. And so what happened is right after Zappos got bought by Amazon, they, by their own accounts, lost some of their mojo. Because they'd always been this company that was barely making payroll, they were struggling, and now Amazon owns them and they're rich, which is great, except some of the passion, some of the vitality, some of the energy, some of the enthusiasm began to go out of their operations. So I said, why don't we get together and do the default future thing, which is what we're going to do here. And I want you to notice, I'm going to, probably the only slide I'm going to read, there is good in this, happy stuff in other words, there's bad, and there's ugly. If you want, and I hope you do, 
a good, robust, useful conversation about the default future, we're gonna do this at our tables, you want all three categories, good, bad, ugly. Here's the good, remember this is from Zappos. We will continue to be regarded as one of the best companies in the world. That's pretty good, might even say that's awesome. Notice here's the bad, eventually we'll become complacent and arrogant, that's probably bad, and then the slow creep of mediocrity will begin. And this one person said, you know, it is so much worse than that, here comes the ugly. You know, I, I think I see this already, but I know it's gonna get worse. I look here, I give voice, it's gonna get way worse. My alarm is gonna go off in the morning and I'm gonna have this sickening dread feeling. Here's the ugly. How, how did this happen? How did my company become General Motors? This was right around the time GM was entering bankruptcy. So they weren't particularly happy. And I said, okay, but before we're done, what actions will people find themselves taking? Because remember, this is automatic. This doesn't just sort of shape behavior in some random way. This drives behavior. Here's what they said, and hence the need for transformation. Enjoy the ride, take fewer risks, keep doing what we're doing now. So for any company, forget the default future, just forget what's at the top. When a group of people in any company comes in and says, I'm gonna enjoy the ride, keep doing what I'm doing now, and not change, what is likely to happen in that group? They're gonna become, they're gonna fail. I heard the word stale. In other words, slow creep of mediocrity will begin and one day you wake up and say, how did this happen, General Motors? So I want you to notice the self-fulfilling prophecy of all this. Now, the fact that it's self-fulfilling is great because it means we can do something about it, but it's weird because they're, they're really great people. They're into education. They give books away to people who go on, on tours. They had never had the conversation about their default future. There's a good chance neither of you. So all of that is preface for what we're now going to do, and you can probably see where this is going. We're going to talk about this at our table. So here's the ground rule. Okay, we're not playing with blanks here. So this is a real discussion. Please engage in it to whatever extent you are comfortable doing it. We're just gonna take about eight or nine minutes, and in the eight or nine minutes, I'm gonna ask you at your table to ask and answer the question, what is the default future in the security industry? So how do you answer it? So you might say, well, I don't really know. Doesn't matter. Go to your gut and say what's there. The trick, and this is gonna sound weird because I teach at a university and got a PhD and all that stuff, don't make this too cerebral. Make it more gut level. So if you've read some forecasts, that's really useful. That informs you, but it's much more your gut that determines your actions. We're going for the gut here. So for eight or nine minutes, if you could have one person act as scribe, uh, person acting as scribe, do not go for consensus. So if someone at your table says something that you don't agree with, just write it down anyway. We're not going for consensus. We're going for the whole variety of opinion. Then after eight or nine minutes, when I begin to notice the lull in the room, we're gonna come back and I'm gonna ask some brave souls because leadership requires courage to read what you wrote down, probably scribes, at your table. So scribes, please do not write down any names. Just say, at our table, we talked about these things. And we're gonna hear a variety of opinion. Okay, variety of opinion, it's all good. Any questions about what we're doing? Okay, eight or nine minutes, scribe, your question, what is the default future of the security industry? See you back in eight or nine minutes. Now is where it gets fun. Let me please have your attention. Come on back, come back to the light. Come on back. Okay, so it gets fun because up until now, these have only been examples to get the idea across. Now it becomes real. Where is a table with boldness and courage that wouldn't mind reading your list? Please raise your hand and we've got some microphones. Okay, see your hand up first. So if we could send a microphone over here. Do we have a microphone? Uh, I do not have a microphone up here. Do we have a? No, you know what happens if you shout, you think your voice is getting through, but then just because of the acoustic, nobody can hear it and then nobody wants to join in because they're not sure if they've said it or not. Thank you very much. Microphone is almost here. The train is pulling in the station. And here we go. Please. All right, so we have a few ideas. Uh, one of the ideas is a consolidation of the dealer base. Yep. As uh, some of the, the smaller family-run businesses maybe age out, and uh -huh. so we see a little bit uh, larger businesses taking over. Um, new threats to, to the market. So as our industry gets more entwined with technology, um, we think that companies like Apple and Google 
um, may decide to pursue a, a piece of this market, and that could be new threats. Um, th that marries into you know the the advances in new technology and biometrics, analytics, uh, things like that. We think are going to have an impact on the default future of the security industry. And then also um, with some of the, the larger companies like AT and T. Uh, kind of reaching in and getting involved in the security industry, that there's a feeling that it will actually expand the market yep. uh, for us. And, and those are the main topics that, that we covered. Great. So again, their overall feeling is that the market's going to expand. Probably if we polled every single person at the table, they might have some variation on that, but that's really good. We'd probably put a lot of that in the good category. We're going to have some of it's, if you're on the dealer side and there's consolidation, that's code for not as much money going into that area, hence consolidation. <laughs> Family-run businesses, I do a lot work with family-owned businesses. There could be new threats. And then the Apples, the Googles are possibly going to get in there, new technology like biometrics. So who's got something other than that? And as I walked around, there was tremendous diversity. Let's go here next, if we could bring the microphone up here. Thank you. By the way, I want to thank the tables for getting into this as, uh, as much as you did. As I walked around, I was really impressed with the, dis the discussions. Please. Is it on? Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, so we actually had quite a few of the same points. Yeah. But one of the other things we saw was that the markets that we go after may change as well and how we go after those markets. So changing up what our services are, changing the recurring monthly revenue streams to other products that we may not be looking at right now, and even to the point of getting to the revenue side of the equation with our customers instead of the cost side of the profit equation. Because right now, we typically go in right. and it's a cost item. If we were to go in with video analytics and can show different patterns, it becomes a revenue conversation. So that was one of the differences that we had. And we had a lot of the other same ones. Did you think there was anything? I think that kind of wraps up. Yep. So I'm um, just to make a, a point here, I'm putting on my business professor hat. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of expansion that's going to happen. People are going to have things that they don't have right now. Companies are going to have things that they're not that they're not going to have right now. And there's something that happens. It's got a really silly name. It's called Churchillian drift, uh, named after Winston Churchill. And it goes something like this: If I gave you a quote and people kind of laughed, it sounded sort of witty. And then I said, you know, Winston Churchill said that. You would all believe me, even if it, even if it was actually Mark Twain. Like Mark, so Churchill said everything that was witty. So what happens is when people decide they're going to go into an area where they have not spent money before and they recognize a brand like Apple, like Google, or one of the affiliated brands, even if from an expertise point of view it is not as good, it is known and therefore trusted, even if the experts say it's not as good. And if you want to see an example, I mentioned I do a lot of work in music and recording, people will swear up and down that the sound that comes out of digital music is completely inferior to that which you get from a real record player. And no one cares. I mean, some people care, but not enough care to shift the market. There were people who said, no, it is qualitatively, quantitatively not as good. When you digitize it, it loses some of the music fabric. And the market kind of said, I don't care. I can get 2,000 songs on my thing. And if I'm 15, year old, 15 years old and I have Napster, I don't have to pay for any of them. How awesome is that? Dad, I don't care if you're a record player you think is better. I've got 2,000 songs. I won. And so how that can affect people like us is we could say, but we understand the market. We understand the, the technology. We see kind of where it's going. But when the big players come in, Churchillian drift. And you're hearing elements of that. Now, does that mean you're doomed? Of course not. It means that we have to go after the, the new emerging opportunities and not, here's the key, do what we've already always done. I, got a, I had a friend call me actually on my drive up when my flight landed. I flew up here from Los Angeles. And he's an executive in healthcare. Uh, they make a, a, something they give to you after you get out of the hospital. I'm being a little bit vague. And he said, I'm crushed. And I said, why are you crushed? He said, our biggest competitor just released this app that has been on my brain for the last two years. I've been thinking about this app for two years. It's going to change everything. And our competitor just released it. Is it over? It, it, should I just quit? Should we, should we shutter and bankrupt the company? And I said, have you seen the app? No, I just read a press release. There's a 98% chance it's not real. But here's the thing. You were thinking about it for two years. What did you do for two years? You thought about it and did what else? You called on the same clients, 
sold to the same people that are communicating to you by buying less that the market is moving. You think the market's consolidating and shrinking. It's not, it's just moving. But somewhere at your competitor, they somehow delegated all that stuff and spent two years working on the new app. So what you really need to do is think about where you want to be and begin having actions consistent with that because whether this app works or not, in five years no one's going to care about that app. They're going to care about something else. The point is you are doing what you've already, what you've always already done and for that reason you're headed toward bankruptcy. And he said, I know, it's just so depressing. Healthcare is 20% of the GDP. It's not shrinking. I mean, the whole point of all the legislation, I'm not giving political things, was not to shrink it, but to slow the growth. It's still growing. Go get your piece. It's huge. You should have boats and servants and all sorts of things. <laughs> I mean, really. It, but, but notice, he kind of got in that mentality. OK, so who's got something we haven't heard? Okay, we've had two tables go. I heard, yes, thank you. And I, from the back, I heard a lot of really good stuff about the do-it-yourself market. So just in case anybody wants to speak to that also. But I saw a hand go up here. Oh, yes, microphone is almost there. Thank you very much. So that's exactly what we were talking about, a lot of the uh, growth in the do-it-yourself. And some of that could be because the thought pattern of the millennium's children these days, or grown-ups, I should say, because I'm an old one, is that uh, the commodity-based security may just be a thing that you want to have. Something is better than nothing. Well, what we do as professionals is we really do put in security systems, fire alarm, and professional systems. Everyone here knows that. So if it's just something simple as an app and you turn off and on your alarm system or security or Bluetooth or thermostat, what do we do for service? If someone's just pressing a button to turn on an alarm system and it doesn't work, what now? So the thought is also, um, a lot of the larger security systems or product manufacturers may just sell do-it-yourself systems. Yeah. And they want it just for marketing and monitoring. That's all well and good. However, what's happening with the outside elements? Are the outside elements shrinking our business as professionals? Or are we growing our business? Point being from our guest speaker here is that the market's out there, so we'll utilize it. We also talked about startup companies, are they keeping up with attrition? From what I hear at our table, they are and they could be growing. Yeah. So we'll do the same thing that the uh, newer startups are thinking about to remain our position in a security industry. So this is really good. I just want to, no pun intended, consolidate what I heard because this is kind of the default feature from the room. There's going to be more consolidation on the dealer side. Family-run businesses might get aged out. There are going to be new threats. The Apples, the Googles might go in our space. There's going to be new technology moving in. I also heard that's expensive as I walked around. Things like biometrics, greater analytics. The AT&Ts of the world are going to reach in. There's a feeling overall that the, marketing, that the market is expanding. And as I walked around, what I heard from a couple tables is I'm not sure people in the room are going to benefit from it. So the market is going to expand, but will we kind of get our Piece. That's why I dropped in the story about the uh, healthcare guy. In the millennial market, a lot of this might be headed toward um, commodity-based security. And you were asking a lot of questions, and so I don't mean to imply a kind of slant here because you were asking questions. But we all know that in the room, what we do is superior. We know that. Service is going gonna, is gonna to be an issue. We could potentially sell into the uh, do-it-yourself market. And then you've got your outside elements. Those might shrink our business, and you've got attrition. So notice what's beginning to happen. So we've got the default future out pretty quickly, and in especially the last couple tables, you're beginning to then say, we actually don't want that. So remember, leadership is making something happen that wasn't going to happen anyway. So now we're going to turn the table to really the heart of the matter, which is if we pushed against this and we decided we wanted something else instead, the question is, what would that be? So in South Africa, where I spent a lot of time, the common view was, after apartheid ended, that anybody with money was going to leave the country. And it was going to be blood feuds and civil war forever. That the country would end up going where Rwanda has since moved. And Desmond Tutu, who I believe is Yoda, he's short, he's from South Africa where they talk funny and so he grammar's a little weird. Since he stepped down from the archbishop's office, he doesn't wear the robes anymore. He usually wears green tie-dye t-shirts. I swear the man is Yoda. And he heard all that and he said, 
No. I said, what do you mean no? We've got the IMF and we've got all these agencies and the United States government have weighed in. This is what's likely to happen. He said, I know. No. Well, what do you want instead? And he said two words that changed the course of the country, truth and reconciliation. And so what happened next is they had truth and reconciliation meetings all around the country where people would walk up to microphones and say awful things that happened in the country. And they might even turn and say, I put a flaming tire on your son's head and he died. I was in a meeting where that was said. It was horrible. It was gut-wrenching. Did it save the country? Probably. Did they have a flight of money? Sure. Did, was it the worst case scenario? Not by a long shot. And they have, they have terrible problems in South Africa, terrible, terrible problems. But I want you to notice, one person came along and said, in his Yoda-like way, no. Well, what do you want instead? Truth and reconciliation. And that's what happened. So this brings up this next question, which is the last one that I'm going to ask you about here. Somebody could mind hitting the forward button on the computer. Yeah. So the term is the invented future. I learned leadership from a man who just passed away a year ago, July. He was 89 years old. He advised a bunch of U.S. presidents and really amazing person. His name was Warren Bennis. Warren was the president of a university, really, really great university. And he decided that he hated that job and he quit and people thought he'd had a heart attack around that time. People actually thought he might have had some kind of cognitive damage. Because why would someone walk away from this really great job? He said, my default future was I was going to be president of someplace like Harvard. Because it was a smaller university, so then you get hired away. And sometimes people have two or three jobs as president, university president in their lifetime. He said, there's just one problem. I hated everything about it. And so I phoned the president of my university, University of Southern California. And Norman was the president's name, Norman Topping. He said, Norman, I want to come out to USC. And Norman said, we've already got a president. No, no, I don't want to do that. But what do you want to do? Notice the idea of an invented future. He said, well, I want to invent a new field. What's that, Warren? Leadership. What would that even mean, Warren? Well, just imagine, Warren said, that someday, and now I'm taking liberties with, with what he said, in maybe 2015 in December in San Francisco at a hotel on a pretty beautiful day outside, people might come together and have actual conversations about where their industry is going. And that wouldn't be seen as weird. In fact, that would be seen as, as being so important that any company or industry that didn't do it would become a dinosaur. Norman said, I'm not even sure I understand what that means, Warren, but sure, come on out. Warren pioneered this new field. And when he wrote his memoirs, he called it an invented life. So default future is what is likely to happen if nothing unexpected comes along. Consolidation and new entrants and the do-it-yourself market and maybe quality becomes a bit strange. And some of it's good and some of it's bad and some of it's ugly. But the question is, is it optimal? And I think most of us in the room would say no. And so, well, then the question is, okay, if you were to turn the page, like my psychiatry friend, and then, and then say, well, if you don't want divorce, what do you want instead? My question is, what do you want instead? So we're going to shrink the time on this because we're going to get to the answer pretty quick. So scribes, we just draw a big old line. And I'm only going to give you four minutes for this question. So you've got to jump to it really quick. The question is, if you, like Desmond Tutu, said, how about no to the default future or no to the elements that you don't want, then the question is, what do you want instead? What is your invented future? Please do not worry about the mechanics of it. Don't go all economist or marketing share in your head. Where leadership starts is with an idea that is vivid, but no clear way to get there. I know that sounds strange. That's actually how the field works. That's why Apple and Google are the companies they are, because they are well led. So they practice this, so can we. Okay, so four minutes. If you said no to the aspects of the default future you don't want, what do you want instead? What is your default future? Thank you. Okay, let's come back together. Now it gets really fun. Come on back, come on back. Okay, whoever's got the microphone, we're about to start running it around. Mike Runner, are you ready? Come on back, come on back, come on back. So please notice something. Notice something. When I said I'm going to send you back in your tables, a lot of you gave me looks of death because you didn't want to go back to your tables. And now I'm having trouble bringing you back. Notice you are actually practicing transformational leadership right now. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. 
Now, leadership must be followed immediately by management, which means how are you going to get there? What are the milestones? What are the investment points? What are the reports? What are the new people you need to hire? What are the joint ventures? What are the associations? All of that. But this is actually the hard part. This is what people have a hard time engaging in. You ask most people, what do you want to be when you grow up, even when they're 55 years old, and they don't know. And you ask most companies, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they say, we don't know. And so they do what they've always done, and it's why so many companies either fail or fail to grow. This does not have to happen to us. So, brave souls, who's got an answer to what do you want instead? This is where you raise your hand. Okay, I see a hand here, I see a hand here. So, yes, if you've got a microphone and you see a hand up, please insert it in raised hand. I saw four or five hands go up, please. Uh, so we see that the consumer value, the, con the consumer's value and expect technology excellence in everything that we do. So they just revert back to us to become quote unquote raving fans and they won't go anywhere else, number one. And number two, that responding agencies also see the value and default to us as the experts. Great. Great. So notice how clear that was, right? Just clear and definitive and declarative. That's how leadership actually sounds. You didn't cite a bunch of reports. You didn't have a bunch of, you know, studies. Clearly you were informed, the table I'm talking about and the speaker. But, like, this is what we want. We want people to revert back to us. We want to be recognized as the ones who bring the, the best quality, period. What else do you want? I saw other hands. Okay, I see a hand up here and I saw a hand up here. So, oh, now we've got multiple mics outstanding. Look, that's innovation. Please. So, in asking what, what do we want, uh, we all agreed we need to own our customers. We need to be more relevant to them. We need to be easy to reach. Uh, they need to rely on us for more and we need to diver diversify more, and provide more things, and not just be a, you know, a siloed security approach. Yeah. Um, and we've got to evolve with our customers, and uh, we've got to kick our sleeping dogs. Yep, kick our sleeping dogs, love it. Okay, thank you, and I saw a hand up here, so let's bring a microphone up here, and then, uh, yes. Uh, we want to remain the uh, relevant and dominant force in the security uh, business and, yeah. and to leverage uh, our, our relationships uh, into other areas, to expand into other areas of technology. Okay, so notice the drift of, of, of so this is what happens. I mean, now as a group, you're, you're getting really, really into it. So it's now no longer a defensive game. You're going to play an offensive game. You're going to play an offensive game. That's really, really fun. In case you haven't heard the story, when Steve Jobs went back to Apple, I collected a lot of data for Apple. It's in the tribal leadership book. Um, we don't reference it as much because Apple's a little paranoid, as you know. They don't want bad, bad things said about them. But when Steve Jobs came back to Apple, everybody knew the default future was bankruptcy. Or if not bankruptcy, irrelevance, but one of those. Everybody knew it. Stock market knew it. Employees knew it. Executives knew it. Consumers knew it. People who love Apple and would defend it to the death knew it. And it was really sad. Tragic. But everybody knew it. Everybody behaved as if it was true. Except for one guy, Steve Jobs. He said, no, I found this place. But it's not just me. It's all of us. We came here to follow a dream. Let's find the dream. What is that dream? And originally, his articulation of the invented future is we are going to be the Nike of the technology world which sounds bizarre, right? But remember, Nike at that point was the most respected brand in the United States, arguably in the world. We're gonna be the technology kind of version of that. So what happened to the default future? After we've been back for a while, it was no longer bankruptcy, it was just irrelevance. Okay, you know, we're, we're not dead, we're just irrelevant. And then a few months, a year later, it wasn't irrelevance, it was mediocrity, which is better than irrelevance. And then it wasn't mediocrity a year or so after that. It was, you know, a good company. Not a great company, but a good company. Good, kind of stable, growing but not a lot company. And then it was a great company. And then it was, if you're competing against them, as the teenager, teenagers would say, OMG. And then it was the most valuable company in the world. That was the default future before that was the reality. Then it became the reality. So what happened? Jobs went back and he had these conversations at Apple. And people became so sickened of the default future, they said, we must change. We must do something different. 
If you want to know what all the research and leadership comes down to, it is one thing. People change when the status quo becomes intolerable. So the purpose of the default future, which we hope you're going to take back and have with other people, have it in your companies, have it in local groups. What is the default future? Explain what it is. You're welcome to use examples that I gave and then have these conversations. And some people will be optimists about it, some will be pessimists about it. It's all good. And then say, but really, is that what we want? Let's dream a little bit. Let's dig. What is it we want instead? And we start hearing words like, we want to be relevant and the dominant force, and then leverage that into other aspects of technology. People are going to look at you like you're crazy. Welcome to transformational leadership. They did it to Tutu. They did it to Jobs. They did it to Mother Teresa. They did it to the companies that founded this area. I've studied HP extensively. People thought Dave Packard was insane. And he built one of the greatest companies of all time. So that's how it works. I saw a hand uh, up in the back for invented, or yeah, whoever has a microphone, please. Yes, sir. Well, we see that the technology is going to be leveling the playing field. Yep. All products are going to be interconnected and interrelated, and there will be no more false alarms. <laughs> I love that. And as the owner of a security system, I love that. My police officers in my area all know me by, I just moved into a new house in West Los Angeles, and hey, Dave, it's gone off again. Yeah, I know, I'm really sorry. Can you help? <laughs> It, but, I mean, notice, it, so we're going to own the customer, we're going to own the customer experience, we're going to be dominant, we're going to be relevant, we're going to leverage technology, and all these things that are really annoying, we are going to put an end to them. I love that. Who else? Yes, please. This, I think, is our last one before we move on to the last little bit here. Well, this is to basically echo uh, pretty much everything that's been said. Yeah. However, we just uh, have it in... In just a uh, few short sentences, it says, be the best of the best. Shout it from the mountains, tops, so everybody knows it. Yeah. If they want it, they will come. And if it's not about the price, they'll buy it. It's really good. So how do you get from the default future, which again has some good stuff in it, to the invented future, which has got some really bold and really great stuff in it? Here's what you need to think about. We're not going to dwell on this now, but just think about it. What is the smallest possible action? It's got a name in management lingo. It's called a minimum viable action, MVA. I'll say that again, minimum viable action that you could take, you as a person could take, that would be completely consistent with the invented future and inconsistent with the default future. Sm smallest possible action. I'll give you two examples. Number, sorry? Yeah, enthusiasm. Just like show some enthusiasm for our business. Not that you don't, and I've gone through the vendor area, I don't know, five or six times. There's a lot of enthusiasm out there, but we could show a level of pride and enthusiasm beyond what we show right now. Anybody else have one? Since so let me give you a couple examples. In, if this were a corporate meeting where you all work for the same company and you were a big company, almost always what comes up is silos. We work in these little stovepipes and we don't know what they're doing and they don't know what we're doing. We pretend that we do, but we have no idea. We don't even know who they are. Oh, we have people who do that. I didn't know. Do you have their phone number? I'd love to say hi, but I don't know who that is. And everybody says we're siloed. So I say minimum viable action. They say, like, what do you mean? Well, for example, are you sitting with people you know? Oh, yeah, I was sitting with people we already know. Great. And you want to be de siloed. Um, how about, I don't know, having lunch with people you don't know? Minimum viable action. Tiny in its commitment required, huge in its impact. Now, for my friend who called my drive-in and said the competitor released the app and that's going to destroy something, I talked to him about minimum viable action, and here's what he said. I know all these people in healthcare, everybody's frustrated, everybody wants to be entrepreneurial, but nobody's being entrepreneurial. I'm going to invite entrepreneurial-minded people from hospitals and hospital supply chain companies to my house for dinner once a month where we're going to pour liberal amounts of wine and get them thinking and get them brainstorming. So his answer, a dinner. I mean, just how ridiculously simple is that? But if you look at the history of leadership, the actual actions are ridiculously simple. One of my other mentors, a guy named Bill Cohen, was a very well-known uh, general, um, two-star general in the Air Force. He just he retired not too long ago, and he was telling me about one big campaign that he'd been involved in. It was very, very famous, and I'm not going to give you the details, just in the interest of time. But I said, what, those days of the war, what was that like? And he said, you know, they were really kind of boring. I got up, and I peed, because you're going to be in the plane for a long time, so pee. And then I get my orders, and I would, 
he was a navigator. So I would navigate the plane and we'd drop bombs and then we'd land and then I'd pee again and eat lunch and then I'd get more orders and do that two or three times and go to bed and I would do that every day for several days. And then what happened? Well, we began to notice something really weird. What was that? We were winning by a lot. But notice the actual activity was kind of boring. So then where was the brilliance? It was actually in the planners who said, this war is not going to go well. We've got to invent another way but the actual mechanics of it. So I'm just going to invite you just to think about that. What's the smallest possible action? A brainstorming meeting. Get together with people who've got some money behind them in a way that you're not now. Once a month, devote a little bit of time to it. You're talking a lot about futurists. Get to know the futurists. I met a guy the other day who came up with a device that kills male mosquitoes with a laser. Now, what does that have to do with what you do? Nothing. But it's damn cool. I don't know, is there something that he might have, but someone like that, just get together, explore, create, delegate a little more of the day-to-day -day management so you can be involved in the future setting. That's one of the big things that people learn about leadership is you've got to delegate the status quo sort of things so you can go out and make the deals and dream and invent. Thank goodness Desmond Tutu had people he could delegate to. So here's kind of where we are in the discussion. Transformation is required, default future, we went deep on that, really hope you're going to take this back. And part of taking it back is then taking back this idea of the invented future, that you're not stuck with what you already had. You might think about minimum viable steps or minimum viable actions. The very last thing we're going to do is I just want to show you the most common types of little groups that you're going to encounter and what to do about them. Okay? So I wrote this book called Tribal Leadership, all of this is from the different stuff that I've written. But I'm going to jump to the most common type of tribal stage. Let me go back one. Sorry, we're going to save Putin. Sorry, do you mind hitting the reverse arrow? My default future is my clicker works half the time. Does anybody recognize where this is from? TSA. Oh, you nailed it. TSA. Okay, now see if anybody's really good if you travel a lot. Anyone recognize the airport? Oh, Denver. Wow, you're on a roll here. Do you have lottery numbers that you could give me for this afternoon? Yeah, th this is Denver's airport. So here's the deal. I'm going to tell you about the three most common types of tribes that you're going to experience. What is a tribe? It's a group of people who get work done. You work with tribes. You might be sitting in little tribes right now. Tribes get business done. They are the most important force that the world has ever seen in, you know, just how things work. Tribes are where the action is. 25% of them communicate like this. What they say is, my life sucks, which is why... Often when I travel, I have a bottle of water that gets with me on the plane. I'm not trying to break the rules. I'm not trying to be bad. I'm forgetful. I'm a college professor. I'm allowed. But why didn't they see it when the thing was going through the machine? Because the group of people, and I'm not, I'm not saying all TSAs are the same. They're not. Some are exceptionally good, and there's very dedicated people in them. But often I'm just reporting my experience and lots of government reports, which many of you are probably familiar with, confirms that this is common that when the bag is going through the machine, the people are collected around the machine, but are they looking carefully? No, they're complaining about the schedule. They're complaining about the boss. They're saying, they want me to work Saturday. I don't want to work Saturday. Why don't they open the other line? Oh, this is stupid. They're getting mad. They never take my shoes off. I, I, I tell them they don't listen. So 25% of the time, people sort of gripe and complain. Now, I've, I'm only going to be with you for, for a few more minutes, but I want to make these live in the room. So you really get the sense of it. So I'm just going to ask for two kind of quick little questions. Question number one, table questions. This will be under a minute at your table. When you are at work and you hear people complain, what is one thing people complain about? So just go around one, one minute. What do people complain about? When everybody's gone around your table, please give me a thumbs up. When you're at work and people complain, what do they complain about? Go around, thumbs up when you're done. Thumbs up when you're done. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, that's, that's good enough. Okay, come on back.
Okay, I'm just going to ask you one other question, then we're going to play with it. Second question, what is one strength or skill that you have, as a person have? In other words, what are you as a person, not representing anyone, what are you good at doing? Are you good at managing by the budget? Are you good at vision? Are you good at resolving conflict? Are you good at customer service? Everybody go around. What is one thing you're good at doing? Thumbs up when you're done. Then we'll have some fun. All right, Th thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good enough. Please come on back. That's enough to have some fun. So now we're going to make stage two live in the room. The three most common stages are called stage two, my life sucks. Stage three, I'm great and you're not. That was where Putin, you saw him come up. And stage three, we're great. If you want to achieve transformational change, you must create tribes that are at the we're great level. Notice how 25% of tribes communicate. So I'm gonna hop off the stage for a minute. What was one complaint that came up over here? Just one. Uh, other people not doing their job. Yeah, other, other people not doing their job. So imagine that I go up to a group <laughs> at, at lunch and I say, how's it going? You say, oh, not well. That's kind of my life sucks. And I say, really, what's, what's going on? And you say, you know, other people are just not doing their job. Here's what you do at stage two. You furrow your brow and you look down and you say, yeah, that sucks. I have that too. And people kind of laugh because they recognize it. Let's see, what was a complaint that came up over here? Just one. Too much to do. Yeah, that's too much to do. I'm actually, I, really, that's the best you can do is just, you know, people, I mean, come on, the, the workload is crushing. There's no way to get through it all. And someone says, you've got to be kidding. Those are such inept, pathetic problems. Mine are so much worse. <laughs> uh, let's see, what came up here, the table right here, as a complaint? Oh, wait, we got two of them. One of them is the coffee's cold. Let me tell you something. So when you're in the security and the alarm business, the same thing is true in surgery. The basic engine of the economy is coffee. And so when it's cold, people don't drink it and everything suffers, right? And what was the other one at this table? And the lack of resources. I mean, we're, we, we can't bring everybody in that we want. And when we do, they kind of suck. And we got too much to do. So then I say, I'm going to take up on coffee. No, it's cold. That's awful. And we just kind of spiral like that. This is 25% of groups talk this way. And if you come back and say, let's talk about our invented future, drool is going to come out of the corner of their mouths. We don't get that. What does that mean? No. Didn't we try that about five years ago? That didn't work. That was a waste of time. I had to work late. I don't want to work late again. No. So what do you do? So I'm going to go through the three, and then I'm just going to give you two actions that can help to really change cultures. The second one, and you saw my graphic come up on this, uh, is called I'm great and you're not. And yeah, there we go. There's Mr. Putin. So I want to now introduce you to a different kind of tribal stage. This is where someone gets up, like Kathy jumps up on stage and says, okay, let's talk about where we want to go. Let's really get into this idea of an invented future. But now it's the 49%, talk this way. That, oh, sorry, back up, back up. Sorry, that was not a point. That was, I was making a point. I feel like I should run for president. That was cool. So um, at stage... So at stage three, people speak in terms of their strengths or their abilities. So watch this. Uh, let me ask you about the next one here. What was one strength that came up here? Execution. Execution. Okay, so a hand goes up and says, yeah, look, if we really want to go to the next level, whatever that means, let me tell you what it's all about. The three most common words in stage three are I, me, and my. I think it's all about execution. I think it's all about getting things done. I don't want theory. I don't want ideas. I want to come together, have a plan, and execute it flawlessly. Right? Notice the kind of tone. I think I'm pretty darn awesome, just like Vladimir here, right? And then another hand goes up when you're done talking. And they say, yeah, whatever. We see it differently. Let me go to the table back here. What came up here as a strength? Problem solving. So then the hand goes up and says, yeah, execution. But look, what if you're executing the wrong thing? No, 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 no. Look, 
Here's what we should do. We've got however many tables. It's all about problem solving. So here's my proposal. We really want to make progress. Well, you were blathering on about the default whatever. I wasn't really taking notes. I was making a list of problems. I got like 20. Why don't I just you know, chop them up and you take one and I'll take one. We'll just solve all these problems and we can go to lunch and feel like we've actually done something. And then the hand goes up here and says, I think you missed my point on execution. No, I understand. I just disagree. What came up here is a strength. Oh, vision, great. So then the hand goes up and says, look, I, I think it's all about vision. And now you both kind of agree that whoever said that is stupid, right? <laughs> vision. <laughs> you know, vision is a substitute for discipline. That's what somebody would say if they're really into execution. Or, yeah, I, I guess, but look, I, I'm sorry, maybe I'm not getting it, but I think we got problems and maybe we should, oh, I don't know, solve our problems rather than go hug some trees and get all vision oriented. I mean, you may be right. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a university faculty meeting. <laughs> welcome to a meeting of surgeons. Welcome to a meeting of lawyers. Welcome to a meeting of accountants or architects. This is how people talk when they have been brought in because they are legitimately the best and the brightest around. So what's the difficulty? Leadership cannot happen at stage three. If you go back and have the invented future conversation at stage three, every person is going to give you their answer, but there will be no gelling. It's like Congress, right? Everybody's got an idea. They sound good. They look good on television. That's probably why they're in Congress. But do they work together and gel? No. The vision thing, which this group mentioned, is absent from stage three. Just to be clear, in our studies, and the tribal leadership book goes into this in depth, 25% of groups gripe and complain. That's my life sucks. 49% talk this way, and they are devoid of leadership. And when a group comes up that acts not as a group of rogue individuals, but as a unit, they are crushed. That's Apple. That's Google. Because it's not a bunch of smart people, although they're really smart. It's a bunch of smart people that are acting with a collective vision and it's crushing in its implication. But now here's the good news. If we can kind of change things, then we can behave a little differently. So um, got to show just this very, very quick video. It highlights the problem of I'm great, you're not. Please watch this and just remember, let's not let this happen back home, so if you could hit the button. Oh, Lillian, I'm glad you could make it. Can I get you a drink? Yeah, something soft, I'm driving. Parking is an absolute nightmare around here, isn't it? Had to reverse into the tiniest of spaces. Still, I managed it. I mean. Parking is not exactly brain surgery, is it? <laughs> and I should know. <laughs> Why is that? Are you a doctor? Careful. Not a doctor. I'm a brain surgeon. Big difference. Big difference. Yeah, I actually know a joke about this. What's the difference between a doctor and a brain surgeon? One's not exactly brain surgery. The other is brain surgery. <laughs> um, so, uh, what do you guys do? I'm an accountant. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I could do with an accountant. Filling in those tax forms can get really confusing, can't it? Still, it's not exactly brain surgery, is it? <laughs> I mean, brain surgery, believe me, is very complex. Are you an accountant too? Uh, no, I work for charity. Oh, that's a very selfless job, isn't it? I really admire you. I don't think I could ever do what you do. <laughs> I say that because it's emotionally draining, not because it's hard. I mean, not exactly brain surgery, is it? <laughs> Which, as a brain surgeon, is what I do. I know, here's a drink. I'm not a brain surgeon, you know. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned it. <laughs> oh, Jeff, I think you laid at the space centre. As always. Uh, 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 have you met Lionel? Uh, no, hello, Lionel. So, Jeff, how do you earn a crust? Uh, well, I'm a scientist. I, I work mainly with rockets. Tough work. Um, what do you do? Why, well, I don't mean to boast, but uh, I'm a brain surgeon. Brain surgery? <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly rocket science. Isn't it? And that's the problem with overwhelming talent and ability. Unless it's gelled together, one guy's talking brain surgery, one guy's talking rocket science, and nothing ever gets done. The last one that I'd like to tell you about is stage four. It is where leadership shows up. The graphic, if 
you're sitting in the back of the room is from the Navy SEALs. And the cool thing about the Navy SEALs, no one would ever accuse them of being soft. They're Navy SEALs. To get in the door, you've got to be in the top 1% of just about everything. Physical fitness, character, decision making, ability to deal with stressful situations and so on. That gets you in the door to train for a Navy SEAL. So what is it that makes SEAL SEALs? They're very clear that it comes down to a consistent set of core values. This is where the values and the vision discussion begin. I've been in parts of Google, I've been in parts of Apple, and those are stage four discussions where it's people that think very differently. Just to make this fun as my time wraps up here, I wanna show you a couple videos that my team and I recorded. I mentioned Zappos, they sell shoes on the internet, one of the most respected companies around. And I wanna show you what we saw all the way back in 2008. It was fun, we went on a visit, and they've managed to keep their culture remarkably consistent and they use a lot of transformational leadership. I'm gonna show you just two very quick videos. My question is, what is important to the people here? What do they value? What moves them? What motivates them? Here is the first one. Here at Zappos headquarters, there's actually a Dance Dance Revolution terminal right in the lobby. It's an innovative company. What do they value? Fun, creativity. Notice, do they have a list of values? They do, it's on the wall, you can look at it, but that's not what's important. The people come up with minimum viable actions to display their values every single day. Last video here, question is again, what do they value? Person who held the camera, 28 and single. So notice how the cubes are decorated. So we can lower the volume on this. I'm gonna talk over it. If you notice the palm tree, that's a load-bearing beam they paper machete it into a palm tree. Now some of you are looking at this and all the skin's crawling off your body because it's messy and it's chaotic and it's, I'm not saying this is, this is what to do with stage four, but this is a group of people that has figured out what is really important to them and committed to it with a tremendous amount of zeal. Notice how the cubes are decorated. We're at the end of the video. See the stuff hanging from the ceiling here? This is called monkey row because this is where the executives work. Notice no one has an office, everybody's in a cube. Chief financial officer is right behind the man in the blue shirt, directly across from him is where the CEO sat until they moved offices about a year and something ago. Their cubes are actually smaller where they move now. Still no one has an office. So as the video begins to fade to black here, what's important to them? Teamwork, Teamwork relationships. You've already said fun and creativity. So notice this is a group motivated by its invented future. You want to know what it's like to live in an identity? This is what it's like. And so kind of what's the takeaway here? I'm just going to give you two actions that summarize all of this. If you find that you've got what I call stage two, which is my life sucks, or you've got I'm great, you're not, you want to do two things, and you want to do them immediately. Number one, meet people where they are. What does that mean? If they're griping, pull up a chair and gripe, and you're, it's going to bug you. But why would you do it? Because you've got to build the rapport. Number two, with great humility, model the next stage. Which means if you've got my life sucks, you're going to have to model Vladimir Putin and talk about yourself and your abilities a lot and use a lot of eyes. I think, I believe, I see. It's going to rub you the wrong way. That's not what great leaders do, except it is. So stage three is a train stop from two to three on the way to four. If you've got a lot of I'm great, you're gonna pull up a chair. You've gotta win the I'm great game, or at least play it for a moment, and then, with great respect and humility, begin to model more like Zappos. So how would you do that? That's where you begin to ask people about why they went in this industry. Why did you do that? Why did you pick this for your job? And probably you're not gonna hear, because I wanted to you know, get my budget right at the end of the year. I mean, it's a, it makes a difference, it's fun, it's about technology. There's a lot of you know, adrenaline, new technology, stuff like that. You're gonna hear core values. You are gonna hear your version of fun and creativity and people and relationships. And what you do at that point is you're gonna shift the pronoun from I to we and say, it seems like we all want the same thing. We value the same thing. And when you're able to have that, that is when you have the default and invented future conversation. That's when the invented future is gonna be vibrant and when they're going to own it. 
So to summarize all of this, we all live out our default futures. Every day, I'm one of the authors on the book on it, and it happens to me. It happens to all of us. On a regular basis, have that default future conversation. Then ask the question, is that what we want? And if the answer, like Desmond Tutu, is how about no? Then ask the question, what do we want instead? Don't be constrained by mechanics and forecasts. Be bold, be audacious. Say what you really want, and then find minimum viable actions, very small steps that show ourselves and everyone that we're doing this, that's the invented future, and we are not doing the default future. But before you get too, you know, have too much fun too fast, pause and notice what are the social groupings around you. If they're at my life sucks, meet them where they are, and then with respect, model the next stage. If it's I'm great and you're not, meet them where they are and with great respect, begin to talk about values that they have in common and see if you can make the values in charge. When you have a group that is motivated, motivated by its values, they are gonna own the customer experience. They are gonna remain relevant. They are going to dominate. They, ladies and gentlemen, are going to invent the future. Thank you. It, it always takes me longer to get up here in the script, so thanks for your patience to this. Wow, was that incredible or what? I mean, just another round of applause. Thank you so Thank much, you. Dave. Thank you. I, I feel in one session you just summarized where we're trying to go and how we need to get there, and we're going to continue carrying this on this afternoon. Please join us after the executive symposium when we talk about next year and this direction and how we work together as a team to take the California Alarm Association and the security industry to that level and the MVAs that you talked about. Thank you very much, Dave. Really appreciate oh, it. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oh, cool. Thank you.